Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna get started. Uh, my name is Monica Granados. I am one third of pre-review, and I'm gonna give you some background about our project, what we're doing, and where we're headed. So the title of the talk is Engaging Early Career Researchers in Peer Review, and I'm gonna talk about how we're doing that, the types of tools that we're using, the community that we're building, and how you can get involved. So peer review. Peer review is sort of, you, you all probably as academics know uh, how peer review works and, and, and how it started. So uh, peer review was, was basically uh, originally just a bunch of privileged uh, uh, white dudes uh, who would get together and talk about the latest science and then sort of just talk about amongst themselves about what the advance, advances in science and the newest research that was being done within this very exclusive community. Um, but things obviously have changed. So over the course of history, there's been uh, more involvement of a more diverse, uh, <laughs> diverse uh, makeup of scientists. The way that we do peer review has changed. You know, it's no longer where people are cloistered in, in a room talking about what's important in science. We like to believe that it's a lot more distributed now, that it, it's a, it sort of happens across the world. Um, but I think the, all of us that are here probably don't necessarily agree with that, right? Like if we really thought that the academic structure worked, that academic, academia was fair, that academia was inclusive, I don't think we would all be at this conference. You know, we're here because we acknowledge that the way that peer review is operating has some deficiencies. And we want to work to make it better, to make it more inclusive. And at peer review, we're particularly interested in including more early career researchers, more people from marginalized communities, because they are being excluded, and as a consequence, their science is not being included. And we're tired of that. So there was a really cool survey that came out from uh, ASAP Bio. And uh, the question was, are you adequately trained in peer review? Right, so if you're an academic, you uh, engage in peer review. Sometimes when you're still a graduate student, Oftentimes, as soon as they give you that PhD, somehow you're magically anointed with the knowledge to be able to determine whether or not a paper is eligible to be put into the version of record. Um, and I think, as these, uh, these statistics show, 3% of the people surveyed in the survey said, yeah, I have been adequately trained in peer review. 53% were like, no, I am not. <laughs> and, and it's true, because I think if, if you're coming from an academic background, you know that uh, there is no formal mechanism for, for training of peer review. OK. Sure. Seems to be rubbing against your Go for it. More than I'd like there. That better? OK. So uh, there's a bunch of people in that sort of disagree uh, category. So what are some uh, potential uh, problems with peer review and how could we address some of these problems? And so at peer review, a pre-review, we are interested in using preprints as a backbone to address this discrepancy. That we, are, we don't have any kind of formal training. You get a PhD or a master's degree and then all of a sudden you're qualified to do this when nobody really tells you how do you do a good peer, a peer review? How do you adequately assess what is good science and what is not good science? How, how do you determine who can and cannot be, cannot be gatekeepers? And so I'm gonna talk about sort of three problems that um, we're trying to address through our platform, through the, through the community work that we are doing. Using preprints as the backbone to address this. I think I'm also just moving around a lot. Um, number one, number one problem. Preprint feedback is not common. So one of the cool things that's happening in scholarly publishing is that there's an increasing adoption of preprints. So more people are starting to uh, know about preprints, are starting to submit preprints. A lot of uh, journals and now have uh, policies that allow for preprints and there's a, a lot of journals actually that now um, work with preprint servers to 
simultaneously take a preprint and put it into a preprint server and have it go through the traditional peer review um, um, a workflow or framework. But we're not getting much feedback on preprints, right? So um, if you go to BioArchive and you just randomly click a couple of preprints that have been submitted onto that preprint server, you're going to find that as you scroll down to the bottom to the comment section, there's just crickets, right? No one is really commenting, even though that is such a good way for you to interact with an author, particularly if it's something that you're working on. Um, so how do we, how could we address that? So what pre-review is doing is that we're taking the existing infrastructure of journal clubs that exist in so many of the institutions that you're probably a part of. You know, there's always that Thursday, Friday, uh, Thursday or Friday journal club where you get together and you read a manuscript and you talk about what's good about the manuscript, what could be improved about the manuscript, um, except that the issue with a published manuscript is that there really isn't a mechanism to provide feedback. It's already in the version of record. But what if instead of looking at a manuscript and dissecting a manuscript that is for all intents and purposes set in stone, we looked at preprints. So the journal club would get together that infrastructure that already exists, instead reviewed a preprint, where the mechanism still exists for you to be able to give feedback to that author. So you'll still get all the benefits of learning how to dissect a paper, uh, of learning how to read a paper, but you can also provide feedback to that, uh, to the author instead of sort of just writing it down in your notebook and it going nowhere. So another cool thing that pre-review is doing is that, so we recognize that the existing framework or, or structure of journal clubs is, is really great and we can sort of co-op that to uh, integrate more preprints. But we're still then kind of beholden to like the walls of an institution, right? It's only the people who already are part of that institution, are part of, you know, have gone through, you know, all the, all the gates to get to an institution that has a journal club. Now, what if we open that up? What if we use all of the cool tools that many people here in this audience, a lot of the community that is here at this conference have built to do virtual journal clubs. And so we are doing what we are calling live streamed journal clubs where we take a preprint and we go through the motions of doing a journal club review except that we can invite people from all over the world. And they don't have to be academics. They don't have to be part of the institution that, uh, that is holding the journal club. We can invite the authors, we can invite experts on that specific topic, and they can all attend and collaborate simultaneously. And so we, we've had some success. We did, a, um, we did sort of our first live stream journal club during Ma's Sprint, and we discussed a, we discussed a preprint that was on uh, open science, and we had the authors attend which was really neat. So we had the opportunity to sort of discuss it. And then at the end, the authors were like, we're here. Um, give us specific feedback about this. Or give us specific feedback about um, the figure. Or is the methodology clear? So having the author there is kind of like a bit of a, you know, it's such an ideal situation. Because I think you guys could all think back of a time where you thought, while you're reading a manuscript, I wonder what the author meant by this. And with this mechanism, you can just ask them, which is really cool. <clears throat> okay, so what's another problem with uh, the, sort of our, our existing uh, infrastructure of peer review? Researchers not really trained, right? We talked about this. We talked about like that. There's no formal mechanism. I went through a master's and a PhD. And I was not once told how to review a paper. But then I got my PhD, and like I think the next week. I got like three papers to review. They're like, well, she's got a PhD now. She knows what she's doing. It's not true. I did not. 
there's no formal mechanism. I, I took classes on ecology, I took classes on statistics, on uh, experimental design, but I never took a class on how to do peer review. And that's a really big part of academic life, uh, about the way that we have constructed the, the, the scholarly publishing ecosystem. So how can we address this issue, again, using preprints as a, as a backbone? And so peer review, what we're doing is that we're, we're we, this um, project was born from the uh, Mozilla Open Leaders Program. And so we're using that really successful model to, to uh, build an interactive peer review training program. So the way that the um, Mozilla Leader, Open Leaders Program works is that um, they have um, like a 16 week program where um, every other week you have a one on one session with your mentor. And then the subsequent week, you have a meeting with your entire cohort. And so it's sort of like this online training platform um, that uh, involves collaboration with people. And so you're actually um, talking to another individual on the other side of the, of the computer. And you're learning about peer review, right? So we, we're, we're going to have um, mentors that come from different uh, journals so that, uh, that, so that have the expertise in peer review, that have seen really good peer review and really bad peer review and know how to tell you how to do a good peer review. And they will mentor you through that process. And then you will have meetings with your entire cohort so you can sort of talk about um, what's working in the program, what you're learning, and um, there'll be lessons in that sort of like cohort model. So again, this is sort of, um, we're emulating the really successful Mozilla Open Leaders Program um, that has borne many successful uh, open, open science and open access yeah. <laughs> um, projects. Problem number three, early career researchers are not in the picture. Um, that's still what a <laughs> an editorial board may look like um, with less bow ties. So the issue um, actually that, that became more apparent to me as I started working in this, um, working in this, this project is that uh, in ecology, it's, it's a little different because you, when you do a, a review, it's usually you that gets the, 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 the credit, right? If, 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 a, if my supervisor got a, um, a request to do a review and they couldn't do it, it goes then to me. And then when I do the review, it, I do it as Monica Granados. But as I started working more in, in, in this um, in sort of the subtopic, I found out that often the supervisor will get a request for a review and then will ask some subordinate to do it and the credit still goes to the supervisor, right? Which seems like not only like really unfair but kind of duplicitous as well. <laughs> Um, and so this is happening in a lot of disciplines. And so how do we ensure that as you get experience in doing peer review, you're also getting the credit? Because again, this is a really important part of our sort of scholarly publishing ecosystem. And you want to have that training to be able to put, you, you want to be able to put that experience uh, on your CV. And so, so using that same mechanism that we talked about uh, training early career researchers in peer review, our aim is to also connect early career researchers with journal editors. So once you're done going through that 16 week program, once you're done, done uh, going through all the training modules with your cohort and meeting with your mentor, you receive a certification. And that certification can allow you to join a pool of certified reviewers that then journal editors can pick from. And you can contribute then through your own name to the scholarly communication process. And so not only is it really great training for early career researchers to like learn how to do good peer review and then write good papers, but it's also really good for the system itself because I know that probably the number one complaint from journal editors is the difficulty in finding uh, reviewers. 
So what if we could just give them a pool of trained reviewers and they don't have to send 17 emails before they find somebody who is available to do a review. We've got a bunch of early career researchers that are nipping at the bud to be able to review, but how do we find them? Peer review is going to connect them. So that's where we're at right now. This is a screenshot of our uh, platform, pre-review.org. Uh, on here, we've got um, a lot of different resources to be able to do a journal club at your own institution for preprints. So we've got templates so that you, uh, do, you can follow the template to, to um, do a review to ensure that you're going through all of the important points of a review. We've got templates to email authors. We've got a template where you can submit, say you are a preprint author and you want us to do a live preprint journal club for you. There is a form here that you can fill out and we will solicit the pre-review, the, the live stream journal club for you. And you'll also find all of the existing uh, pre-reviews as we call them. So they're the reviews of preprints on our website. So it's full of uh, resources, um, but we've got some cooler things to add. So we're in the process of um, shifting to uh, a new platform, so creating another platform that allows us to, um, for you to have a, an, um, a profile on, our, on the platform so that you could keep track of the reviews that you're doing. You can keep track of the courses you've taken, how you're progressing through the mentorship program. Um, to uh, submit the pre-review, you can also um, to find other pre-reviews, so as hopefully we start get, getting more and more content on our website. Um, and then ideally also again to solicit, say you're, a, you're an author of a preprint and you want a pre-review, you know, you want to take advantage of again this existing infrastructure, you could solicit through our new platform. Also working on this uh, new initiative with uh, Outbreak Science. So the idea is that we also want to have different mechanisms for you to engage in, uh, in, in peer review and to learn how to do peer review. So you can go and do a uh, pre-review of a preprint and sort of do sort of the long form uh, dissection of the paper. Um, but we also think that it's really important sometimes to just get as much data as we can from as many preprints as possible. And this is particularly important when we're talking about uh, public health crises or epidemics. Um, it's, it, it's been discussed that the preprints are some of the most important tools during epidemics because preprints allow sort of the rapid dissemination of information when you need rapid decisions given the, uh, given the time scale that epidemics and crises uh, sort of um, happen. So we're working on a, um, a platform, so it's like it's an extension of the new platform that we hope to be launching next year to uh, go through as many preprints as possible in this, in this space so that we get um, data that other scientists can then use to make decisions during public health crises. So um, look uh, for that soon. And we're also really fortunate that we're going to be doing a, um, so I, I talked to you about kind of the power of doing these live stream journal clubs and, and being able to invite the world to these. Well, during the open access week, we're uh, partnering with PLOS and we're going to be doing three live stream journal clubs. And Daniela is currently tweeting out the registration link. So if you're interested in participating, <laughs> we're going to be doing a uh, we're going to be doing three live stream journal clubs: one on bioinformatics, uh, one on neuroscience, and one on ecology. We've invited the authors of the preprints. We're going to have experts on the topic there, um, as well as the um, pre-review team to uh, facilitate the call and some uh, alumni of the Mozilla Open Leaders program. So if you want to see what it's like to do a journal club with the world, um, sign up to, to, to uh, participate in this really cool experiment that we're doing with PLOS. So finally, like in the last thing I want to do is that, what I want to say is, um, Platform is, is one thing, and, and obviously we need that, that infrastructure to be able uh, to do the things that we're interested in doing. Um, but ultimately, it's 
and I think I, I hope you guys have all seen through the talks that you've attended today is that this all really is about community, right? We are building a scaffolding for the community to come and participate. We wouldn't be where we are if it were not for the community of people uh, that is, uh, that is uh, lifting pre-review up, not only in terms of support, but also the people who are writing these pre-reviews, people who are coming to these live stream journal clubs, people who are facilitating the calls. And um, at the heart of it, we believe that community can advance uh, open science and can advance the adoption of preprints, can bring more people into doing peer review, which is such a foundational, uh, it's, it's the bedrock of, of, the, of scholarly uh, communication. And we want to make it easier, and we wanted to make it more inclusive so that it doesn't look like the, the, the Linnaean Society meeting from 1792, right? I want to see more women. I want to see people of color. Like, that's, that's the kind of scientific community that I want to be a part of. So finally, just want to um, thank the many organizations and partners that have allowed us to get as far as we have. Um, Code for Science and Society, who are our uh, fiscal sponsor. PLOS, who's been such a champion of the live stream journal clubs and our partner in our Power to the Preprint event that's going to happen during Open Access Week. Uh, eLife, that invited us to, uh, a, to do a sprint that has helped us build a lot of the, um, the uh, infrastructure for the new platform we're working on. Mozilla that connected us uh, together um, and that have inspired so many people to build really cool things in the open. Uh, and ASAP Bio who are also huge champions of preprints and incredible supporters of our, of our work. And last but not least, uh, my dream team, uh, Sam and Daniela, who uh, are, if you're going to work with anyone uh, at midnight on, uh, <laughs> on projects or submission of grants, uh, I couldn't imagine working with uh, anyone else. So this is our um, Twitter handle. Don't forget the underscore. That is our website. And if we have time for any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you for listening. Oh, and I'll remind you to, to yes, to use the mic. Thank you. Um, so my question is, as you do um, the pre-reviews, by the way, this is fantastic. I'm super excited about this idea. Um, but you don't work as the preprint server, right? You're using, right. you're pulling the preprint from PLOS or from wherever mm -hmm. it is. Do you have some mechanism already in place or planning to in the future that's like a linked data notification or something that is notifying that preprint that, hey, come look at the review of this article. Totally. Yeah, here. yeah. So right now, um, the, 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 ex the existing um, link is that if you go to uh, BioArchive and you ha there is a, uh, there's a preprint that has a pre-review, it will at the bottom where like the comments are, it'll say, it'll link the pre-review. Um, but the idea is that for, with a new platform, we'd also notify the author. So right now everything is manual. So if you've done a pre-review, there's also a template that said, hey, we picked your preprint. Go check out the pre-review of it. Uh, but the new platform will have an automatic notification mechanism and we'll still sort of maintain that the, the the, that link that BioArchive has put in for us. And it, it exists for other platforms as well. So there's a couple of other sort of like similar initiatives. Um, and uh, if you do like a pre-lights, which is like another type of um, sort of preprint uh, review platform, you can, um, you can see that review as well. So there is a, a mechanism to sort of like link those two together, yeah. Two questions? Yes, please. Uh, first why stop with preprints? I mean, uh, we have a very, very bad need for post-publication peer review elsewhere. We don't really have a lot of forums. PubMed almost shut down uh, last year. We have to appear, but I mean, mm -hmm. I think a platform that actually addresses and brings new stuff that could actually be interesting not only for reviewing preprints, but for reviewing papers. And I guess like 90 percent of journal, 95 percent of journal clubs at this moment are discussing a published paper, not a preprint. I mean. Why, don't, why not go into that kind of market as well? And second, yep. uh, for the outbreak science, why stop at outbreaks? 
<laughs> yeah, no, great questions, and I uh, have questions. I have answers for both of those. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll address your second question first. So the sort of the recency effect here. Just, like, if I get diagnosed with brain cancer today, like brain cancer becomes an outbreak for me. So I mean, I, I for sure, know. of course, of course. And if it's the argument that like sick, surgeon, but like everything surgeon. Of course, yeah, of course. Or like a conservation, like I'm a conservation biologist. If it, it, it the the population of caribou, right? Like it, we we need data on like what is happening with the population of caribou in uh, in Canada. So the so we believe in open science. We believe in open access. We believe in open software. So the way that we are building the extension to our platform, everything is done in the open and in with this uh, with the uh, like the Kogu Foundation calls uh, hypermodularity. So these modules will all be built in the open, so that if you are interested in doing this for um, preprints of brain cancer or of caribou populations, you can take that module and then do preprints of any topic that you deem uh, requires immediate review. So that is something that we've that we've thought up. Um, the reason that we used uh, this particular example and we want to start here is because sort of there's a precedent and like already like a built-in community that uses preprints, um, but there but um, in our uh, development and grant writing process that is something that we've considered. So it is something that's going to get used um, to address your first question. Um, we think that preprints are are there. The problem with the published literature, again, is that there really is no mechanism to provide feedback to something that is already the version of record. And that oftentimes still exists behind a paywall. And so by, by um, reviewing preprints, first of all, especially if we're talking about trying to build an inclusive community, I want to make sure that anybody who comes to my journal club, whether it's live stream or whether it's in person, they can access that paper. You know, anyone can come to these live stream journal clubs and I want to make sure that they can read the paper and that it's not locked behind a paywall. And so this is why we're focusing uh, on preprints because not only do we want to train um, early career researchers and, 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 and anyone who is interested in peer review, but we also want to advance the adoption of preprints. I really think that preprints is a, is a mechanism to open science um, and that I think that more people should be adopting that. Question? Yeah. Okay, Thank you. everyone to the keynote. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.